Welcome to Common Science, and this week we have a story cast. And this week, Lauren, my partner, who's who's also a co-host of Common Science, she chose Mary Beth to come on with me and have a conversation about science and and life and what she's about. And I'll just let her give a quick little uh, picture to our listeners about where she's at in life. Boy, that's a big, it's a big question, isn't it? Where are you in life? Um, well, let's see. I'm the librarian for the University of Minnesota Rochester, um, and our campus, specifically and exclusively, has people studying health sciences. Mm. So even though I'm not technically a medical librarian for all practical purposes, I'm a medical librarian because yeah. nobody's studying French literature, right? Right. Um, I come from. A fair number of medical people in my family. My mother was an RN, or BSN actually. Um, my sister is a retired respiratory therapist. My niece is in school as we speak to be yeah. a nurse practitioner, and I faint at blood. So, um, <laughs> my, so I'm, I'm actually yeah, I'm actually pretty good at science. But and my mother yeah. wanted me to follow her into nursing, but it's like, mom, I'd never get through a surgical rotation. I mean, I just right. it's just something I can't control. Yeah. So the advantage is that as a librarian that deals with people who are studying medical science, I understand the lingo because I grew up with it, mm -hmm. right? When you grew up with a nurse, they talk in medical speak a lot of the time, when right. they're describing different things that are going on and and so you learn that that language. Right. Um, and it is a different language. Every every community of inquiry, of course, has its own language, but oh, totally. medicine seems to be very specific. Yeah. You know? um, so it's handy that I that I grew up with, with that sort of thing. It's not the path I originally intended to take, but here I am. Totally. That's uh, fascinating. Yeah. And one thing that I'm sure will become clear to our listeners that is that life is windy and, and oh since my, that yes. wasn't yeah <laughs> wasn't the, your yeah. original path where were you so you were in you came from a family in the health sciences well not just my mother my dad was just a stockbroker oh okay yeah. just your mother mm -hmm. okay just your mother and then your dad was a stockbroker and you're way back in high school where where were you at in high school i was um going to do anything music because mm. i sing Okay. And so I actually entered college as a voice major. Oh, wow. And Where did you go to college? I went to the University of Wisconsin. Okay. Um, but one of the smaller campuses. Okay. They've got a couple of two-year campuses that then feed into the four-year campuses. Sure. And so I was at one of those and studying music and realized that I could sing without having a degree in it because I really had no interest in teaching at that point in my life. Gotcha. And so I bounced around and switched majors a couple of times and ultimately yeah. ended up with a degree in history because I was at the end of my junior year thinking I just want to get out of college right which is all of uh, <laughs> any of us that have that are of an age yeah. now look back on that time in our lives and think what were you thinking you know but <laughs> but you know at 20 years old right. I'm thinking I want to get uh, out of the world and get a right. job and do things so um I looked at all of the courses I had taken, and other than music courses, the electives that I had chosen were all history. Interesting. And I thought, well, okay, there we yeah. are. And so my undergraduate degree is in history because I obviously have have an interest in it. So yeah. Where did that come from, do you think? My, oh, I don't know. Um, Mom and Dad had us watching documentaries and sure. all that sort of thing when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, gothic romance novels, probably. I oh, suppose. yeah. Because yeah. you know, <laughs> they're all set in the 19th right, century. Right, you know? right. <laughs> That's very fitting. Jane Eyre and Rochester and all that stuff. Wow. Um, man, so you're, you're thinking about history and ended up majoring in history. Uh, yeah, like what... So you're you're graduating and got a job in a furniture store. Oh, there you go. Because yeah. 1980 was not a very good year to be graduating out into the oh, out man. into the um, workforce. It was terrible financially. Yeah. And so I just got any job I could. Right. And so wandered around. That didn't work out for various reasons, um, and ended up working back with a man. Who I had worked for in college. I worked for a man named Marty Stein who owned a series of drugstores in the Milwaukee area. And um, 
I was downtown Milwaukee looking for a job, and he had a small storefront in like yeah. the big building in Milwaukee. Yeah. And I saw him, and I went up to him, and I said, "I need a job." Right. Because at that point, I'd been unemployed for like six months, and he said, "All I've got is like a front checkout. I said, I'll take it. You know, just I need right. a job." Right. And so. I started back with Marty, which led me into his optical centers. Right. And I learned to be a certified optician. Huh. Was board certified in the whole nine yards. Wow. Did that for a number of years. And then I just didn't want to work retail anymore. Essentially, yeah. I mean, opticianry is this very weird junction of medicine and retail. Yeah. That I don't think exists in just about any other facet of anything medical yeah it's a little odd it's, you know it's, it's, yeah, right you so yeah. um you're on the one hand i was i was an ophthalmic technician and on the mm -hmm. other hand i'm selling you glasses so right, i mean it was just right. weird but um but then i got to make the glasses that was cool and learning about the mm -hmm. lenses and the powers and how this all worked and i remember distinctly in fifth grade learning about negative numbers and thinking when am i ever going to use this <laughs> And that's sure when you enough. use that, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was an optician for a long time and then just didn't want to work retail anymore and I got a job as a stockbroker because my dad was. There you go, yeah. And I thought, well, I grew up in the business, I can do it. Hated it, hated it, <laughs> hated it. Um, although I'm really good at handling my own retirement fund yeah, now right. because I know what I'm doing. But yeah, that was a year and a half that was yeah an interesting experience but not you know so anyway Man. i got back into opticianry for a short time and then went over to higher education mm. but as um an admissions rep and, a, and an academic advisor yeah and did that for a number of years i worked for marion so college entered. and marquette university and so i just uh wanna like so there's so many I just want to express there's so many parallels that I see and it's a little comforting to somebody of my age as a as a a younger millennial uh with the covid pandemic mm -hmm. and, and all these scenarios just making the job market a little tough and, mm -hmm. and knowing how difficult it is or has been for myself and many other people of my generation it's like oh yeah it, it was it was difficult in in 1980 and uh -huh. for i mean yeah for everyone and uh yeah and all i can say to that is this too shall pass right you yeah, know it's great to it, great to know yeah and it's comforting for sure um and every here. experience that you have will just add to the person that you ultimately end up being right oh yeah i mean i hated being a stockbroker but I learned things that I now use in my real life. So oh, yeah. none of that is wasted. Right, um, yeah. Oh, 100%. I worked uh, in IT for a year and hated it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, as far as figuring out how to set up a podcast and set up a website and all these things that I learned then uh, that are useful now, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful it for it in, yep. in some regards uh, you've got so, some skills right yeah that's yeah. that's uh, so you went to so another thing too that i've noticed in in my uh several jobs since graduating is it's also important to know what you don't mm -hmm. want and so your stockbroker mm -hmm. experience oh for sure crucial well and i wasn't smart enough to or brave enough i guess to quit Mm. My boss called me into the office and said that he was letting me go. And he said, it's pretty obvious that you're miserable and life is too short. Go yeah. do something you you like. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, you should embroider on a pillow, right? right? Life is too short. Do what you, you know, go do something you like. Um, and so higher education was a good fit for me. And I liked the jobs, but it mm -hmm. wasn't quite exactly the niche. Right. And then amongst all of this, I met my prince. Mm -hmm. And he took me to, to Nebraska. <laughs> he was the IT director for a firm that went bankrupt in Milwaukee. Oh, man. And he ended up with a job at Cabela's headquarters. Wow. Um, it, which is in Sydney, Nebraska. And so I, of course, moved to Sydney, Nebraska. And um, What's I, Sydney, Nebraska like? Small. Except it's the biggest city in three counties. It's it's far western Nebraska, so it's fifty nine miles from Wyoming. Okay. 
and it's every western you've ever seen right it's the mesas it's yeah. the tumbleweeds it's the sagebrush and and prairie dogs and yeah. rattlesnakes and the whole nine yards yeah and um the history person in me loved it because the oregon trail went just north of there mm -hmm. um the sydney deadwood um trail for for our listeners and for myself because I've heard a lot about of a lot of the Oregon Trail, but mm -hmm. I actually don't know the significance. The Oregon Trail was the highway, if you will, for wagons going west mm -hmm. in the 19th century. So there was this big push to move west. Right. To some they will they would end up in Oregon. And I think that's why it was called the Oregon Trail. But there were also others that branched off into California or wherever. And so right. settling the far west, not the west where I lived, right? Yep. Um, but settling yeah. the far west, the west coast, right. you had to, you, you got in a wagon and you drove with horses and oxen right. and whatever out um, to the west coast, which are... It can be tricky. I mean, that's where things like the Donner Party or the Donner, the Donner Party. Mm, um, Party. The Donner Party was a party that went through the mountains a little too late hmm. and got caught in a snowstorm. Oh wow! Yeah. And I think about half of them survived. Jeez. And there was significant evidence of cannibalism that happened oh, because man. they had nothing i mean it was wow. just awful wow and so the trip the trip west was tricky f not only because it was long and arduous and all that right. kind of stuff but you had to time it right or it could be deadly yeah so that the oregon so many people went on the oregon trail that the ruts are still there that's incredible. So you can go to western Nebraska and see the ruts from the Oregon Trail, which I just found fascinating. That is super fascinating. And then, I, I don't agree. know if any of your listeners ever watched the show Deadwood on HBO. I have not, but oh, I know many people who do. It's fabulous. So, I highly recommend yeah. it, but it's not for anybody who clutches their pearls at, at swearing. So, okay. Because um, <laughs> there's a lot of it. Um, but... Um, Deadwood, Deadwood, South Dakota was due north of Sydney. Okay. Um, yeah. By car now, it's about four hours maybe. And so the closest railroad stop to Deadwood was Sydney. And so huh. the train would stop in Sydney, and then you would get in a stagecoach, and you would take a stagecoach from Sydney up to Deadwood and those ruts are still there too. Wow. So I mean all this wonderful yeah. history is out there and I'm I'm totally digging right. it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Just but yeah, out in very Nebraska. small town. Yeah. Um as I said, biggest city in three in three counties. Um I would have told you I was a small town girl cuz I had grown mm. up in a a western suburb of Milwaukee in, in sure. a typical suburbia, big yard, lots of trees, all that yeah. kind of stuff. That's really not a small town. <laughs> and so I get to Sydney, which surely is a small town. There's 6,000 people. Yeah. And I realize uh, what I am is a woman that wants to live in a relatively rural area that's 45 minutes from a major metropolitan area. That's a little different. So yeah. anyway. That's funny. That's learned similar, that one the hard way. Similar to me. <laughs> um, but I learned how to do online shopping when I was up there because I had no other option. Right. Um, so... We get out to Sydney, the only job that was open for me was as the director of the public library. Mm. And they wanted a master's degree, but not necessarily one in library science, and I have a, hmm. a master's in organization leadership. And so I thought, well, how hard can this be, really? Right. It's an, it's an organization. <laughs> well, and I've managed things before. I came, I came to City it. with 12 yeah. bookcases full of books. How hard can this be? And so, oh, I'm such an idiot. So anyway, I, I get the job. And then, once I get the job, I realize that, oh, this is what I want to be when I grow up. Now, I'm 43 years old at that point. That's right? also incredible to hear so, for, for our listeners. For all you are youngins who are thinking, oh my God, no, 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 just yeah. live your life. And <laughs> what, what's supposed to happen will happen. Um, and I was lucky enough that I had a woman who dealt with the adult librarian stuff, and mm -hmm. I had a children's librarian, and I had a cataloger, thank God, yeah. and a businessman. So I just got to be the director, which was lovely. Um, but 
I, I got my second master's in library science yeah. online while I was in Sydney. Okay. Because wow. I re- that's so when the, I realized. The learning curve must have been steep. Um, it was interesting because I learned more from my coworkers mm. than I did from my teachers. Fascinating. And in some respects, the teachers were just flat wrong. Wow. Um, there was one instructor who was teaching us how to weed, which in library lingo is how you pull books out of the collection, like weeding your garden, okay? Huh. This isn't good anymore, let's weed this out, right? So it's books that are, um, in fact, there's a whole Twitter thread on on books that are weeded out, and it's, yeah. you know, like, now they're just hopelessly inappropriate or sure. creepy yeah. or, you know, we really don't need books what on is, how to, yeah. you know, code in this ancient computer language right. or, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. So um, my instructor had was an was an, an attorney mm-hmm. who also had her her master's in library science, but she had only worked in the law library when she was a graduate student. Mm. That was her only experience in libraries. Right. And so she's telling us that how to weed a collection based on age. Now, that's probably true in a law library to a point. I mean, you do want to keep the older stuff because you want to know what the Supreme Court said in 18 yeah. blah, 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 right? But, you know, some but of the older to, stuff you can just but, get rid of. Yeah, to your extent, things right. get overturned. Or, that's yeah. not how it works in a public library, right? Right. Um, and, in fact, as we were going through, I started to pull a book that was really beat up. Sure. Um, and... The staff was like, no, 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 put that back. And it was a book that was published in like the 40s or 50s. And it was specifically geared toward ranchers. And this this is cattle ranching country out there. Um, Ranchers and doing like first aid for cattle, sort of. I mean, it was was those kinds of basic veterinary things that you could do before you had to call in the veterinarian. And this thing had been used to death. And unfortunately, it was out of print. And so they just kept fixing it as best they could, but they didn't want to pull it wow. from circulation yeah. because it was still being used. So by my teacher's rules, that right. thing should have been gone 30 years ago. Right. But by the real rules, you want to look at how, is this thing popular? Are people really using it? If yeah. it's still in print and they've used it to death, we'll just get a new copy. If it's not, you have to figure out how to keep it so that people can still read the thing. So it was just interesting yeah. that, that the teachers were more out of touch with real life in right. libraries than yeah. my staff were. That's, uh, uh, I mean, just a take home message in and of itself is, to, is, is just, yeah, I mean, teachers do and are important, obviously, and like do, can provide a lot of framework but you got to get your hands dirty and, and, and learn mm-hmm. on the job or wherever yeah. else. And, and uh, yeah, I, I've learned so much from, from doing whatever it might be, whether it be computer programming or uh, working on this podcast. Uh, yeah, that also kind of reminds me to, so you're, it's fascinating, like the, the idea of like somebody using the book being a, a more effective measurement of when we should, uh, whether or not we should keep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in computer science, uh, a stacking algorithm, which sounds complex, but it's, it's, it's an efficient way of mechanism of sorting. So uh, like when it comes when it and you can just think of it in terms of like your papers on your desk right Mm -hmm. um the more recent papers that you've used tend to rise to the top so like by just putting back the last used paper on top uh generally they'll they will just sort themselves by like how useful they are um but yeah, anyways, uh, yeah, and that's has all these applications in, in computers and, and how you manage memory and data and things like that. But I'm sure in, in library science too, learning from the teachers or from your staff members, there's a heck of a lot of uh, sorts of abstract 
ways of, of managing books mm-hmm. or information. Mm-hmm. I, I was curious if you could touch on like, yeah, either more terminology or like what makes library science. Well, it's interesting. I, I and I, I this is this is kind of that juncture between library science and um, IT. Mm. But when you talk about sorting algorithms, when you're doing research, especially when you're re- doing research online, which most of us are these days, the algorithms that are underlying things like Google sort them for you. Mm-hmm. And if, if it's the first time you've ever used Google, right? Yeah. It's going to just sort it as it thinks it should be. Mm-hmm. The more you use Google, the more it learns who you are. Which is why when you start to type something into the search bar, it like fills in. Sure. Like yeah. I'm a member of the Rochester Symphony Board. Right. And so when I type in ROC, it fills like Rochester, Rochester Symphony Board. <laughs> you know. yeah. um, and so it, it, it learns who you are, which is great fun if I'm looking for the website that I tend to visit fairly often. However, if you're still doing research, it's going to bring you the results it thinks you want to see, which mm-hmm. means you are missing a bunch of research that might be really important to what you're looking at, mm-hmm. but Google isn't showing it to you. Right. And so when you're looking at the research algorithm you've got this big bump at the front and then you've got this very long tail at the end and sometimes the long tail stuff is what you want and you'll never see it yeah the big bump just to clarify for our listeners that's like the 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 documents or files or whatever else websites that are most popularly Mm -hmm. visited right so you end up with like a a huge um visitation rate Mm -hmm. to a select few uh, sources, but then yeah. because of this kind of phenomena that you're talking about um, uh, of the Google learning right. from well, and the other the other challenge with some of these algorithms, and there's a wonderful book out there by Sophia Noble, I think Sophia her name Noble. is. Sophia Noble, okay. And I'm tr- I'm blanking on the name of it, but it she talks about the underlying problems of racism in the algorithms of some of these mm. these databases like is it Google algorithms of oppression yes sir there that you is go. it and um, she talks about how when she first that this has changed to a point because Google yeah. got a little bit of religion but um, and, and mostly they got religion from her <laughs> because when she started doing this she would type things in like you know how you can start it a search and say Irish women are and it'll give you right. yep. results or you can just you know so she would type in black girls are and the entire first page was porn Jeez. the entire page Jeez. Um, the same with Asian girls yeah you type in blonde girls and it's pictures of beautiful blonde girls, and it's Golfing it's the or... soccer team for <laughs> yeah. you know some college, sure. and so the, it was this jarring difference in how these people are. I mean, think of being a, a nine year old black girl, and you type in black girls, and that's what you see, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so she called Google on it, and they were like, "Oh, it's just the algorithm," and she's like, "No, no, no, no. there is a person behind that algorithm writing it." Um, just for our listeners to, how would you define algorithm? A program, sort of. Yeah, a program. It's like a, so, yeah, it's like a set of instructions and like a set of decisions, like a decision tree. Um, so like, if this, then this. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, like you're talking about, man, that's. It was awful. I I hope. And it was terrible. And so she she called Google on it and they pushed back a little bit, but ultimately that now has changed. If you type mm-hmm. those those phrases in, you're not going to get those kinds of results. But I think the the important thing here is to just keep in mind that when you're using those sorts of search engines, and I'm not talking about a library database. Yeah. I'm talking about a you're out in the wild search engine. Google, um, Facebook, Google, um, any of them. Yeah, any of them. Um, you're going to get results 
that are determined by some wizard in behind a curtain somewhere. Right. Right. Um, this is why, as a librarian, yeah. um, and you're doing actual research, you need to be in a library database so that you're not dealing with all this nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because a library database is going to have academic information. It's going to have academic journals and articles and all that kind of stuff. So you're not going to get this right. white noise of yeah. other that, stuff. That's super, super valuable to people who have university access in particular do well, you have any yeah ideas for people who might not be affiliated with the well there there academia? are databases i mean for instance in minnesota okay um the the state has paid for the university of minnesota to subscribe to a number of databases on behalf of mm. the people of minnesota so if you go to a public library mm -hmm. or perhaps even when you were in school, yeah, you might have encountered the Elm databases, and okay. those are databases that have been purchased. The, the access to them has been purchased for anybody in the state of Minnesota by the state of because because the University of Minnesota is a land grant university. We belong right. to the people, right? Yeah. Um, so to a point, you can you can come and see anything. Now, our students and faculty and staff can see over and above that because they've paid fees sure, over and above to that. to other right. universities. But the other yeah. thing is if you're doing like hard science research sure. and you're no longer affiliated with the university, especially if you're in a state that is a land grant, that has a land grant university, mm -hmm. um, you should be able to go physically onto campus and look at stuff. Because right. you can't hear. Yeah. I mean, at the University of Minnesota, you can walk into any University mm -hmm. of Minnesota campus, and we will be we will give you access to a computer, and you can do research. Yeah, yeah. And I have people that do this. I have people that are retired, right. but they're still interested in biochemistry or <laughs> yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. And they come in with their little flash drive, and they download a bunch of articles, and they go on their happy way. And so, I mean, huh. th there's ways to do this. It's yeah. a little more tricky than me just right. being able to sit down on my computer, but. That's uh, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, yeah, just I'm unaware and I, I don't think many other people would be. So that's good to know. Um, beyond that, too, I think uh, one other issue that's brought up with what you're talking about, about the algorithms learning to show you what you want mm -hmm. is confirmation bias. Oh, absolutely. Where, yeah, like you might have some thought or belief up. Oh, my cat Esther is going to feature in the show. <laughs> she wants to be held. Uh, yeah, like where you have one thought or belief, and then you, it starts to show you uh, information that's in that vein. Mm -hmm. How? Uh, yeah, what sorts of things do you? Obviously, you said the university database, um, like trying to focus your research there. Uh, what other sorts of tips or, or suggestions do you have for people to, to not get? so trapped in there there's a, a website out there called all sides all sides i think it's all sides.net maybe okay um and it will show you all sides of a news story and so let's let's pick simone biles that poor girl um it will show you a central mm -hmm. story it'll show you a story with a right wing bias and it'll show you a story with a left-wing bias. Huh. And so you can start to then be, become informed enough that you can make your own decisions. Because the problem right. is, most of the news you hear, and I'm sorry, I don't care who it's from, <laughs> has a bias somewhere. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, I teach my students online, if you're looking at a website, scroll to the bottom, go mm -hmm. to the About section, see who these people are. Right. And sometimes they'll say right out, you know, we're there's a there's a web site called rights right wisconsin mm -hmm. well i think i know where the bias comes from right <laughs> yeah and to some extent that kind of makes it okay because now i know where they're coming from right and you can read it through that lens sure you know you can read it and recognize okay this is where these people are coming from i'm not sure i believe it let me look at these guys and then you go over right. to a left-leaning website and read their version of things mm -hmm. and frankly usually the truth is somewhere in the middle 
Right. So I, when you're dealing with academic databases or even with searches and, and confirmation bias, I don't know that this comes up as much as it does on these expletive Facebook memes that go right. zapping about. Yeah. Um, and what I really encourage people do is to just take a breath <laughs> before you share. Sure. And double check that it's true. Mm -hmm. Because more often than not, it's not. Right. Or it's such a, a perversion of the truth that yeah. it, it's it's not fair. And so um, it can it was it's been a challenge the last couple of years. And frankly, I lay this right at the feet of social media. Yeah, right at the feet of social media. Wow. Um, yeah, I I can't agree more. And, <laughs> and I think that, uh, yeah, the thinking before you share, I know, I think, I think Twitter implemented a feature where if you have not actually opened the link, it asks you, like, if you would like to, like, oh, you haven't read this, like, are, are you really meaning to share? But it, I mean, obviously, you can still share. So, yeah, <laughs> like that's the that's an issue in and of itself. And I think uh, I think MIT found that uh, misinformation uh, travels seven times faster than what's true. Which, I mean, well, yeah, I would say to some extent that probably is confirmation bias right there. Because right. if you and I have a similar belief system, right? If we both believe that so-and-so would be a fabulous president or a horrible mm -hmm. president or whatever right if we've got that same belief and i find some meme that that confirms that ah see i knew so-and-so was horrible yeah i'm gonna share it with you and you're gonna go mm -hmm, see mm -hmm. she said she and we yes so-and-so yeah. is horrible and so then it snowballs right yeah and so i i don't know um it's it's the take a breath and check. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think to uh, so I saw this pretty jarring graph because I was I'm also pretty interested in the, the misinformation, uh, disinformation and social media dynamic uh, where they analyzed tweets and like who was associated with who over time and like the there's this big ball of blue and a big ball of red mm -hmm. and and just a continuing divide between yep. uh the politic those of of left and right political leanings uh i would i would say i mean is is due to many factors but definitely exacerbated by the this kind of phenomenon of like you're talking about mm -hmm. this the snowballing of confirmation bias um yeah, so one one thing that I've done is getting off of uh, a lot of social media mm -hmm. or, or reducing my consumption of it to, like, small, small doses. Um, yeah, another, it's again, a little hard, but, like, following people outside of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. I think, uh, is, is helpful, too. And just having conversations with people. Uh, so that's, that's the other thing is it's, I mean, a little challenging, so... Dre, Lauren, and I will have the podcast uh, on a non-story cast week, uh, and we'll talk about a topic. And we have some similar leanings, but we come from different backgrounds as well. And so uh, that's been really helpful for, like, if I'll, I'll throw out a, what I think is a fact and then get called on it or whatever else. Uh, so just having conversations, too. Um, man, yeah, as far as the... The, to get away from the the misinformation and algorithms uh, piece a bit and back to the library. So you're in Nebraska mm -hmm. and you're uh, the director of the library. Mm -hmm. uh, was there a step between then and University of Minnesota Rochester? Uh, yes. When we moved to Rochester, um, I was working at the regional library system. Mm -hmm. Um, as the regional librarian and so that yeah. was that was great because I was able to get yeah. to know all the libraries in the area and that sort of thing um, but the the problem with that position is that y it's very solitary it felt it, basically it felt mm -hmm. like it did in quarantine <laughs> right. for the last year because I was in an office all day long all by myself and 
I'm kind of an extreme extrovert, and that is the worst thing you can oh, do to gosh. me. Oh, gosh, yeah. And so when the job came open at the University of Minnesota for their first librarian, I thought, well, now this would be fun. I enjoyed higher education. Um, I'm digging a library. I'm yeah. going to go, I'm, I'm go do this. It's and so a perfect fit. I was hired at UMR. Yeah, and so. you have more student contact. Then. Yes, yes. Yeah, what are your responsibilities like as a... Well, it's a little different because library. we're pretty much a, vir a virtual library, okay. which is weird. Yeah. So um, I'm an academic library with about 100 books. <laughs> Wow. Um, I tease the Twin Cities that they're, re they're my remote storage because, <laughs> you know, I can get a book from the Twin Cities yeah. in a couple of days. We've got a very robust delivery system around Minnesota. That's nice. Um, and so I get all their databases. Um, I get books in a couple of days. And frankly, I'm, a th I'm on the third floor of a shopping mall. I can't have books up there right. to any real extent or I'll fall through the floor. Books are very heavy. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so you've, do, you've got to do a lot to support the weight of books if you're going to fill a room with them because they will fall through. That's fascinating. Um, I, yes. I, I bet there's like a niche in architecture for library Oh, I'm sure there is. There's <laughs> a story about the Albert Lee Public Library, which is built um, kind of in a side-by-side -side building. And the one side is City Hall mm. and the other side is the library. And at one point, the library like stretched over and co-opted I think the third floor of um, the the area where the city hall was yeah and stretched that's where they put the children's area they kind of made that bigger over there and it's sure. it's lovely um, but in the meantime they also needed to redo the carpeting because it was a thousand years old right. and hideous and yeah. all that kind of stuff so they're moving all the books out of the library and putting them in the central atrium of the building and what started to happen is that the elevator doors weren't or weren't working properly. Oh goodness! Because they were, they were tilting the building. the The weight of the books was skewing oh, the goodness. building so that the door. So they were like, oh, "Okay, got to move the books back." You know, it's, <laughs> I mean, it was a really good illustration oh, of, yeah, "Oh, that's right, that's books a, really are heavy, aren't they?" That's a great um, so definitely, I'll keep that in mind. So I'm moving up to Minneapolis at the end of this week and. We have a fair, fair few, uh, fair number of books to, to lug. So for the sake of my back, I gotta keep that in mind. Just don't line them up in the middle of the room. <laughs> put them on the outside. Yeah. Too. Um, man, that's yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah, put them on the outside. That's a really good, good advice there. Yeah. Um, so most of my job, instead of the care and feeding of a collection, yeah. which is what a lot of libraries have, right, is is um, instruction, is student instruction, and. Wow. Um, it's more challenging for students now than it was back a thousand years ago when I went to school because if I wanted something from the library, the librarian would say, well, it's over in that area, and I'd wander down a stack of books and find what I needed, right. um, or I'd look through the card catalog. Yeah. You'll have to look that up on Google if you've never seen a card catalog. <laughs> um, and so you look through the card catalog and you find what yep. you want, you go find it, you take it out. Um, so um, to some extent we've lost a little bit of the serendipitous discovery that happened when you sure. did that. But on the other hand, it's a much more direct route. Right. Um, the problem is, most of y'all, <laughs> when you come into college from high school, no your way around a computer but you really don't know how to search anything oh yeah you have no idea about boolean operators mm -hmm. which are the which are the, like the rules of how you search in a database yeah um you have no idea how to how to really look for stuff effectively um and god help you you'll do a google search and you'll pick the first five that come up and <laughs> that's usually not a very good idea yeah. so you know I, i've somebody some Bon Mott in the in the library world said at one point that the internet is the world's largest library, but all the books are on the floor. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, you can find everything you want in the in the internet. <laughs> Good luck finding it. Right, it's there somewhere. Now, a librarian can usually beat. I can beat Google into submission and find what I need, but. I know all the tricks, right? Yeah. And it's just going to be easier, trust me, to go into a library database and look there because again, you're you're getting rid of all that white noise 
and you're getting into the stuff that you really want. But it's it's having to teach those skills yeah. that is a big part of my job because that skill set wasn't installed when you <laughs> right. were in high school. Yeah. And so um, it, it's my job to help navigate all of the wild, wild west that is the internet plus the library databases so that the students can find what they need. Man, that's, uh, that's incredible to hear that you say that it's harder for us now. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I think about my parents and other people who have said like, oh man, we had to go to the library and we did. Look, look, look through these books. It's so, well, so much more difficult. Well, it, and, and it was to a point, but on right. the other hand, you, you didn't, you did, well, there was a study, and I forget who did this, but they talk. It's it's talking about choice and how much more difficult it is to make a selection when there's more stuff to choose from. Mm. It's like if you only had fifteen boxes of cereal, you could pretty quickly determine which box of cereal you want. Right. But when you've got an aisle of I don't know how many hundreds of boxes of cereal, <laughs> right. you you kind of get stunned Just into incomprehension, yeah. and so. It's sort of that same thing when you're dealing with online searching and even searching in a library database. There's so much information. Oh, yeah. And to some extent, God, that's fabulous. You've got all of the world's information <laughs> right. at your fingertips. On the other hand, you need to figure out how to find it. Oh, because yeah. otherwise, you're just stunned in the incomprehension because there's just so much out there. Yeah. It's a it's a life skill uh, mm -hmm. for sure, and it's something that I have gotten better at over time. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, it's just, but yeah, I've definitely gotten better at finding what I need out of Google. Um, but I could I could get better at the uh, like Boolean operators mm -hmm. and, and getting better at my uh, academic research. Uh, as far as as far as Google goes, when I worked in IT, oh man, it was, yeah, how I solved every problem. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, oh yeah, well, me. and I'll do the same like, thing. It's, yeah, you it's, know, it's, it's um, it, it is incredible in that way. If you're able to ask the right question, mm -hmm. uh, then then you can find what you want. Well, uh, and when you're thinking about Boolean operators, just keep in mind that they are named for a 19th century mathematician named George Boole, who was an algebra guy. Hmm. And so any of the and, not, or, yeah. right? And the parentheses, if you're doing it properly, properly, end up looking like an algebraic equation. Oh, yeah. So, like, oh, <laughs> algebra, I get it now. Right. You know, so, yeah, just keep that in mind. It's awesome to see that, that you make that connection because uh, that's something that in my last interview cast of uh, Bryn uh, Shank. Uh, he's an energy auditor, so we got our diverse gamut of, of guests. And he uh, talked about how asking questions is the source of all knowledge. And, and like in that way, it, you become more capable of seeing these connections mm -hmm. uh, and and seeing the connections between mm -hmm. <laughs> Boolean operators in a search engine and and ninth grade algebra. That yeah, you wish you had paid maybe yeah. more <laughs> more attention to. Oh, it's like those darn <laughs> negative numbers. <yeah. laughs> uh, that's too funny. Yeah, I I've definitely uh, so beyond uh, the search searching realm uh, for information boolean operators are super useful when it comes to computer programming oh, I so suppose. if anybody ever ever wants to get into that pay attention in your your algebra class uh <laughs> yes you will use this later <laughs> you will use this later that's too funny um also it's i mean so just to bring uh bring back your conversation about your responsibilities at umr mm -hmm. i think what is super cool is that you ha now have more time to dedicate to training young minds uh and like you also say that you were the first librarian at umr i am uh so lauren uh my co-host uh for our other casts she uh attended so i think i don't know if we ever said university of minnesota rochester uh 
but on my conversations with her, it, I envision uh, UMR as sort of a startup. Well, yeah, you could absolutely say that. Um, I started at UMR in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I think, no, employee number 34. Wow. Um, and they just gave me a big room and basically said, go do library. Yeah. Right? And nothing was put in place. I didn't have an ILS system, which is the computer system that you do the searching that that I do searching for for books mm -hmm. and then check them in and out and all that you know it's all that the back the, the back room stuff that that runs um, the library right yeah. um, I didn't have one of those I needed one of those yeah um, and the university wasn't quite used to the kind of collaborative nature of a campus like UMR because up until that point the campuses were kind of standoffish with each other yeah you know don't, huh. don't touch yeah. me don't touch me um and i come up and it's like hi can i play in the sandbox and they're <laughs> right. like who are you who are you, what are you? <laughs> okay i guess i don't know um and so it took a little while for them to become comfortable with me and yeah. you know all of us saying and can we do this and how about that and yeah. how about if we do this and um, so it was getting everything going and that was a bit of a challenge because I've always had in the back of my mind that I'm setting a precedent what I do now some librarian 30 years from now is going to look back and hopefully not say what the hell was she, she thinking yeah. um, so you know, I, I'm trying to develop this, the the programs and the systems and and just build the library to be what the students need and hopefully will continue to need from there on. Right. But that was, I mean, it was it was really fun and really terrifying oh, all at yeah. the same time. You know, it's kind of like, here's a room, do what you want. And it's like, oh, God. Um, and so there were already a bunch of computers in there, and I took out half of them, and I put in big, comfy chairs, because I figure a library's got to have big, comfy chairs, as far as I know. Oh, concerned. absolutely. And so big, comfy chairs, and so students will come in there. It's the one quiet spot on campus. Mm. Um, and so even if they don't want to talk to me for research yeah. info, um, it's a nice place to come and do your own, your own work, right? Um, so it's become it's become a very popular place on campus. It's very popular Sweet. during finals week. Oh, I'm sure. Um, we're studying yeah. the lead up to finals. Um, but yeah, everything I've done, I've done with an eye to not only what will this look like, but how will it scale? Right. Right. I can't set the precedent that I'm going to sit down with every single student that we have for yeah. an hour a week and chat about research. Right. Yeah. That might have worked with our first class because we didn't have that many students. Right. Yeah. Right. Now I could. I don't. I don't have. I, you don't have the time. You're the well, and and there right. literally isn't that much time. Yeah. Um. So everything I do, I have to look at how will this scale as we grow. Mm. Um. And so far, so good. That's yeah. That's uh. It's it's a tricky for for anyone who's not worked in a startup or a young company or a young organization uh i recommend like i re i recommend you like if you as long as your finances are in order i think it's a little different with the university of minnesota rochester because we had a little bit of money support. back in this <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but yeah i think that it's it's an incredible experience to try to try to work your way through that and and think about yeah setting the the precedent and creating the processes and systems and uh it's yeah the blank slate is fun, is fun mm -hmm. and also intimidating well but and and it's been especially fun at rochester because i mean we were told as a campus mm -hmm. if you could build a campus a university campus without any i mean there are no rules just do yeah. what's what's best for the student how would you do it and so the university at, in Rochester is a little different. Right. And we've been written up in national 
press because we're a little different. You know, yeah. the way the way that the students are taught is different. Yeah. Um, the way that we interact with them is different. Um, and a lot of, and frankly, because we were able to do what we wanted, there were no sacred cows in the corner. So there yeah. weren't people that were, that would say, oh, no, you can't do that because we've always done it this way. And, oh, no, we can't say we didn't have that. Yeah. So you just do what makes sense for the student. And the other advantage is because we're so small, because we're so new, we're very nimble. Mm -hmm. And so if you try something as kind of like, well, that didn't work, um, you can quickly shift and yeah. do something else, right? right. So we're the little speedboat yeah. <laughs> driving around the ocean liner that is right. the University of Minnesota because we can we can spin around and change relatively quickly. Yeah, um, which is I think why we're a bit of a an incubator for some sorts of things. Yeah, um, you know this next gen med thing that's going on is just us. Right, but I wouldn't be surprised if it sure. grew larger. If, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah too. To plug that for our listeners, we're, we're, uh, we have a few other things I'd like to talk more about uh, before we wrap up on time, but uh, there's the Next Gen Med uh, program at the University of Minnesota Rochester, which is an accelerated bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in health sciences in two years instead of four. Correct. Uh, and it's being produced in partnership between UMR. Mayo. Uh, the Mayo, Mayo Clinic, Clinic and, and Google. Google. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So uh, I will link the the news release on that in the show notes, and you can check it out for yourself. Uh, it might be worthwhile if if somebody is is considering college is for them. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll we'll we're, definitely we're plug still that. putting the wheels on the bus. So right. stay tuned. <laughs> be, you know, but it, yeah. it should be it should be interesting. If you, yeah. if you want to be the guinea pig and the, yeah. <laughs> as the the <laughs> well, buses. Then that's, that that's to a lot of the that's to the credit of a lot of our students because mm -hmm. especially our first class. Right. We're going to be the first class at a university. Right. They didn't, you know, it's and so they they fully understood that they were the guinea pigs. Right. And kind of embraced that. Yeah. But also then, felt very free to say to the professors, "This ain't working." Right. You know, um, and so they helped us shape things. Yeah. So our students are very involved in the whole process. I mean, it's not like when I was in college and I'm one of 300 in a big uni sure, big yeah. room and you know, I'm pretty not, sure my professors yeah. had no idea who I was. Um, so That's cool. Yeah. The, the intimacy I definitely see value in. I went to Carleton College where mm -hmm. in Northfield, Minnesota, small class sizes mm -hmm. and definitely helps with the, Great the group learning of librarians, process, I think. Just saying. Uh, I unfortunately, so I wish I had spent more time with the librarians. I know it's a sin in this conversation with a librarian to admit that I didn't. I didn't get to know my my, my librarians. And they're very cool people. Enough. The librarians at Carleton have trading cards. Hmm. I'm just saying. Wow, they yeah, are cool cats. They are clearly. Man, uh, we might have to find, look up some some pictures of those and link them in the show notes <laughs> as well. Um, but one last uh, topic to touch on before okay. we we wrap up, uh, since this is the the common science cast and we talk about uh, common science in our daily lives, not just in the workplace but also in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, what sorts of personal pursuits i mean you brought up your interest in music and and like where do you see science in that or cooking well I know you're also an well, and cooking yeah. um and pottery you know yeah. there's science in all of it really when you look at it but there's a very interesting connection between music and mathematics mm. and there are an inordinately large number of of medical people who are also musicians. Fascinating. And I'm not sure why that is. Yeah. Um, but you will find, I mean, even in the symphony chorale, we've got we've got a whole bunch of doctors. I've, I've often thought if I'm gonna have a heart attack, this is the place to do it, because half, yeah. the, half the chorale is, is medical of some sort. Huh. Um, of course, that's pretty much true of anywhere in Rochester, right. really. But, um, the, you know, when, when you get into a situation where over half the people that you're involved with are in medicine in some form, mm -hmm. it kind of makes you wonder, is there a connection here between music and medicine? 
What is yeah. the connection between music and medicine? That's There's a fascinating, fascinating man who actually will be giving a concert here in Rochester in the spring for this symphony. And he yeah. is a psychiatrist in New York. Huh. And he's a very, very good concert pianist. And he will give concerts talking about the psychology of the composer. Hmm. So he'll give a concert. I saw one on Gershwin. And he was talking about the Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah. And he's pretty sure that Gershwin was ADHD. Um, probably had some other things going on. Yeah. And he would play different pieces, different parts of Rhapsody in Blue to demonstrate what he was talking about. Huh. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where you just kind of sit back and go, hmm, never <laughs> thought of that, you know. Right. So right. I, I'm not sure what, what um, composer he'll be doing yeah. this spring, but he's it's fascinating to listen to. He did one on Beethoven, oh, yeah. and unfortunately I missed, but I heard it was just spectacular, you know. Right. Um, and then he plays the piece, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, very cool. That's a, a fascinating observation that you have made, because I've also thought about that some, too. Uh so in uh you're you're bringing up it up in the context of medicine and music mm -hmm. uh the connection that i had or the theory that i had been kind of playing with uh and thinking about some is a connection between being an artist and a scientist mm -hmm. and how being good at uh, like one and and another mm -hmm. kind of adds up into something more mm -hmm. uh, like has an emergent property to it uh, because I mean on the one hand in artistry or music you have to be pretty darn comfortable with the unknown mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, improvisation right and improvisation yeah super super true I mean when you when you think of most research into the unknown mm -hmm. right not lab work where you're just seeing if I've got some, you right. know, an infection or something, yeah. but research into the unknown. Yeah. There is an element of improvisation there that m might lend itself to either art or music because both have that same mm -hmm. sort of sensibility. Because um, you can't just keep, you know, if you keep just doing the same thing, and it, well, then you're just a factory, right? right. But there's, there's a, an expressiveness to art. You know, when I'm throwing a pot, I'm, I've got an idea of what I want it to be at the end, but oh, yeah. it, it may or may not be that at the end. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there, you just, and you just improv, you know, you, you yeah. kind of work with the clay and see what it wants to do. And, and all of a sudden you've got a bowl instead of a vase, you know, oh, I yeah. mean, and so, yeah. um, and, and with, with, I've never been a painter, but I would imagine it's the same thing. You sure. know, you get in front of a canvas and unless you're Bob Ross with your heavy little trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was an expert already. <laughs> Stuff yeah. out, you know. So, um, yeah, I think I think improv is probably a really big piece of that. It would be interesting to know if there's theater people, too, because yeah. comedians, uh, improv is a big part of theater. Oh, yeah. I think about... Um, yeah, I wonder how many how, how many funny doctors <laughs> there are out there. Yeah. Because I, I was just thinking about one idea when when you said improv that immediately popped in my mind is an emergency medicine doc oh sure you gotta you gotta improv sure. <laughs> everything at that point yeah uh, so i mean maybe not everything obviously they have they have some procedures for certain situations but every patient is different and so well um, and and the timing of the patients is different mm -hmm. it's not like if you're i'm at my office and i'm sorry your appointment isn't for 10 minutes <laughs> right. you know i mean yeah they, people come in when they come in and right. with the stuff that they have and so there's absolutely an improvisational what other sorts of so we we touched on improv diving into the unknown any other sorts of connections that you see between this medicine and music and while we're building out this theory that on common mm -hmm. science. Well, I, I guess it would be more, and I, I'm not familiar enough with medical research mm. to really be all that conversant, but when they're dealing with music and you're dealing with chordal structures and you're dealing with progressions and you're, de you know, you're building mm -hmm. one on another and, you know, if you put this note in there, it's going to be dis. A, 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 dis a discord, right? Sure. It's going to be discordant. Is that what you want, or do you want to do something else? I would think that when you're when you're 
doing research and just kind of messing around Mm -hmm. there's that same sort of thing it's like you've got the basic building blocks of the research but then you start poking around the edges right what if i drop this in there what'll that do right oh yeah um so i i think i think that there's probably that well and again that's to some extent improv but you've got the basic building blocks of the the thing right yep, the yep. business the, the oh yeah the, yeah having the foundational and then right and so unless knowledge. you've got that yeah. foundation whether yeah. that's having practiced piano a thousand times when you were a kid or or right. having done scientific study yeah you've got to have the basic building blocks before you can really start improv to, yeah improv and and push the you can't just some. sit down at a piano and oh, start yeah. improving that just sounds like noise right, right. there's right. got to be a, a structure right. in there somewhere oh yeah yeah an underlying structure well, and, and think about what the, i'm sorry i keep it oh no you're like, all so good. excited I'm, I'm, I'm um this. think about what the scientists did with the covid vaccine mm. right mm-hmm. they had basic building blocks they had a basic um structure right they had this new thing they were going to try yeah and lo and behold it worked but you had to have the basic building blocks first. Thank you, Jonas Salk. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you had other vaccines. You knew how they worked. You knew how those building blocks functioned. Mm-hmm. You had this new thing that you wanted to, that you think would probably work, but you weren't sure. And now we're in an emergency situation. So now it's time to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Oh, yeah. Right? And so... I, again, they needed the basic building blocks before they could add this thing just to see if it oh, would work. Yeah. Um, and so there's the improv. There's yeah. the foundation. Um, thank God for all of the, the people that worked on all that stuff so that they were able to get us vaccines as quickly as they were. Yeah, I but agree. I think it's because virtually every scientist in the world dropped what they were doing mm-hmm. to work on this vaccine these vaccines and you had countries and companies working together and that very rarely happens that's super true so when people are like oh i don't know this vaccine was developed too fast me 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 um well yes it was but it wasn't it was developed so quickly because literally the entire world was working on it oh yeah yeah it is incredible uh to see how much cooperation and coordination Mm -hmm. came out of the crisis yeah and and people being willing to to yeah dedicate their time and, and resources to it uh yeah that's another thing we can we can link into the show notes is is a little bit of information on on that and uh yeah obviously there's the a few different vaccines but um it's it is remarkable uh to think that these uh these I, research products, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, came out so quickly and so rapidly, and have have had a heck of an impact. And we hope we hope we can get to that mm-hmm. herd immunity someday. Uh, everybody but, get a vaccine. Yeah, everybody get a vaccine. Yeah. Is, is the moral of the story. <laughs> yes. So we can get out of this sooner rather than. Well, rather right, because the whole idea was we're developing a vaccine. <laughs> Woo! Everybody get the vaccine, and now everybody's like half of us have. <laughs> yeah, like half of us have. So, anyways. Um, yeah, I I appreciate having you on, and we'll we'll wrap up for our listeners. We're about time now, uh, but it was a pleasure, Mary Beth. This was delightful. I learned incredible uh, <laughs> amounts about the Oregon Trail, uh, about Boolean operators and and googling, <laughs> and as well as we've kind of uh, wandered well all over the place, haven't we? Yeah, art and science and medicine. So yeah, we've wandered all over the place, but it started with asking a question and. And I enjoy having you on. And Thank you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank God for air conditioning is all I can say oh, at this point. Oh, that too. Yeah, it's yeah. incredibly hot here in yeah. Minnesota. <laughs> hey, Common Scientists. Hope you enjoyed the cast. Thanks for investing in Common Science. We hope it brought as much value to you as it did to us. To learn more, smash the subscribe button and visit our website, commonscientists.com, where you can read our blog, join our email newsletter, and follow us on social media. Finally, if you like what we have to say, you can absolutely support us on Patreon. We can always use more support. You can navigate there also from our website, commonscientists.com, common scientists with an S, so that we can continue cultivating a community of common scientists.